cool if my new apartment had better lighting. Okay, June wrap up, wrapping up the books in June. I'm here, I am focused, ready to go. Hey guys, it's Casey, and today we're gonna talk about the books I read in June. So June was a super mixed bag of a month. It is, however, the first month in like two or three months that I actually managed to finish my TBR. Thank you. In addition to my TBR, I actually read two books on top of it. So basically, The Slump is Dead and I have killed it. And I'm so happy about it. As far as ratings go and quantity, the month started off really slow for me. I was not loving everything that I was reading and I just wasn't getting through much. But by the end, it really started to ramp up both in quality and how much I was getting through. And I think that is continuing on through the beginning of July. And I'm so happy to finally leave that several month slump behind me. But let's just look at a general overview for how June went. And so for June, I had two five-star reads, three four-star reads, one three-star read, and two two-star reads. One of those four-star reads is like almost a three and a half to four, and my urge to bump it down just so I can have two in every category is so high. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the books I read this month. So the first thing I read was Persepolis Volume 2 by Marjane Satrapi. So this I gave three and a half stars overall. I liked this one, but I did not love it, and I didn't like it as much as I liked the first volume of this. So this is a memoir told in a graphic novel format about the author's life growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. And the first volume ends with her being sent to school in Vienna, and this follows her when she's in Vienna and her life there, and then it chronicles her return back to Iran. And I just didn't connect with this one as much. It feels weird to say that someone's life story wasn't as interesting, but to me it didn't hit as hard. I definitely felt like a lot of her experiences were interesting and relatable and the struggles that she went through growing up, especially through like high school and things like that, were very interesting to watch and watch kind of this difficulty and this trauma of leaving her country behind. How that played out and unfolded in her life, I really enjoyed. But something about this like thematically just didn't go as smoothly as the first one. I remember in the first volume that I felt like I really connected with her story, which is still true in this one, but that there was also a very clear like thematic progression throughout it. And I felt like that thread was lost a little bit in this one, but I still really enjoyed this and I thought what it does is so interesting. I really like this graphic memoir kind of format and I felt like it was a really unique way for her to tell this story. And so while this volume was a lot more personal to her, I feel like it was somewhat less impactful than the first volume and because of that I think I rated it slightly lower at a three and a half. The next thing I read was House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski and this is so far outside my comfort zone, it's wild. I think I mentioned this in my July TBR, but if I didn't, me and a couple of my real life friends started a book club in June and this was the first pick and I'm still not sure how I felt about this book, to be perfectly honest with you. I think for the purposes of this video, I'm going to say it's a two and a half stars, but I have so many thoughts. I considered doing a completely dedicated review video just to this book. And honestly, if dedicated review videos are something you guys would like to see, let me know because I've been strongly considering starting to do them. But anyway, this is the weirdest shit I have ever read in my entire life. This was wild. So this is a horror book, which already is outside of my comfort zone. And beyond that, it is just the strangest and most interestingly formatted book I've ever read. So this book has several different layers to it and it's kind of hard to explain. So you're kind of reading from the perspective of this man named Johnny Truant who has collected collected all of these writings of this man named Zampano. And Zampano was recently found dead, and all of these writings are things that he's been chronicling, written on scraps of paper, well documented, just kind of a frenetic collection of writings about this documentary called The Navidson Files. Now, The Navidson Files do not exist even within the fiction of this book. So in The Navidson Files, our main character, is exploring this house that he's moved into with his family that is kind of its own character and entity. Basically, the dimensions are not what they should be. There is a hallway that never ends. There's some kind of presence. There's something in this house. And so there's all these different layers that the story is kind of operating on. It is really interesting because there are all these references to like academic papers and interviews and things about this documentary that Zampano has put in. And again, this documentary, even within the fiction of the universe, does not exist. So it's kind of wild. And this book is formatted like really strangely and it is honestly a trip to read. Overall, I think some of my favorite parts were actually reading Johnny's very clear descent into madness throughout it and I thought that was interesting, but basically my thoughts on this book boil down to the fact that I don't think I enjoyed myself. I feel about this book how I feel about jogging. Like, I'm glad that I did it, and I'm proud of myself for doing it, but I can't say I had a good time 
during. While this is definitely one of the most weird and unique books I've ever read, I can't really say I liked it that much. However, I do think that if I actually went through and reread this book, I would be able to kind of figure out a lot more of what was going on within it because a lot of it didn't get revealed until later on and a lot of it doesn't get revealed at all. It's very open-ended, very strange, and there were a lot of interpretations even among my friends about what the ending of this book really meant, and I really want to make a video on this, actually. If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't understand this book, and I don't also understand what the author's intent was with this book, and I think that's one of, like, the big things, is I'm not exactly sure what this book was going for, so it's hard for me to even give it points for, like, did it do what it set out to do, because I'm not exactly sure what it set out to do. This was a wild time. And I don't know if I recommend it. I don't know if I want to put someone else through this pain, but if you've gone through this pain, please talk to me about it. Because it won't leave my head. The next book I read was Days of Blood and Starlight by Lainey Taylor, and I also gave this one two and a half stars. So this is the second book in the Daughter of Smoke and Bone trilogy. And this is a YA fantasy series about this girl named Karu, who is an art student in Amsterdam. Since she runs errands for this man who is not really human, he's kind of a demon chimera creature named Brimstone. And what she does is she collects bones and teeth. And one day while she's out doing this, she runs into a man named Akiva, who, and it turns out Akiva is an angel. And so this opens her up to this world of chimeras versus angels. And this war that's kind of going Going on behind the scenes of humanity. I read the first one mid to early last year and I think I gave it three stars overall. I liked it but it didn't blow me away and I felt like I liked this one even less. I felt like this one was a kind of a chore for me to pick up. This one was very frustrating for me. Like the premise of this story is very interesting. I really love the war, the war between the chimeras and the angels and where we've gone from that and the ending of the first book was so interesting that I was really excited to see where that was going to pick up in this one and for me it felt like it wasn't expanded on as much as I wanted it to be. Like the parts of the ending of the first one that I liked and the implications and places we could have gone with that I felt like we didn't really go with this and a lot of this was frustrating YA fantasy romance tropes and I felt like this book was a lot bigger than it needed to be. I felt like there was a lot of time where we weren't doing much. Like I felt like there wasn't a lot of progression but there also wasn't a lot of character development that would justify the plot not progressing at that pace and I don't know this one just kind of while I didn't have a bad time while I was reading it like I didn't actively dislike it I never felt the urge to pick it back up and in fact I had to force myself to pick it up to keep, stay on track with my reading goals for the month. Like this one did kind of feel like a chore to me. So this one is ultimately two, two and a half stars and I'm not entirely sure if I'm gonna finish out the series. There is only one more book, but this one took me so long to read and the last one I think is even longer and I'm just not sure if it's gonna be worth it or not at this point. So if you've read this series and you think that this is just kind of a middle book slump and you think the third one could be as good as or better than the first one, let me know and I'll probably finish it out, but I, uh, just not sure if this one's for me. The next book I read was Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia and I gave this one four stars. This is the one I was considering lowering down to three and a half just for the aesthetic purposes of the chart but this is a four star book I'm pretty sure. So this book follows our main character Cassiopeia who lives in a small town in Mexico in the 1920s and she works almost as a servant for her family that don't really respect her or treat her very well and she dreams of someday leaving this town and one day while she's cleaning up her grandfather's room she finds this old chest and she opens it she finds a old skeleton in the bottom of the chest and while she's rummaging around she gets a shard of bone stuck in her finger and after that happens the skeleton reanimates into a man that says he is a Mayan god of death and that Cassiopeia needs to help him reclaim his lost throne from his brother. And not to mention that because of that bone shard, she's intrinsically tied to him until she succeeds in doing so or she will probably die. So this book follows them as they go to get pieces of his body and things that he has lost back so that he can reclaim the throne from his brother. And I really liked this overall. I had a couple of complaints with it and most of those were in the pacing. So I really liked the characters, especially Cassiopeia. She has this fun little dynamic throughout the entire book where she's been raised in this more like conservative of society and then the jazz age is so scandalous that she goes throughout the whole thing going oh I can't do that because then I would be a whore unless and like it's very good and I really enjoyed that progression of her and I loved the folklore elements of this like I haven't seen I haven't read any fantasy books based in Mayan folklore and mythology like this and so I thought that was really interesting and the biggest problem I had with this was the pacing it felt very fast-paced 
I think this book could have been 200 pages longer, like this could have been a 500 page book and I think I would have liked it even more. It felt like there was no fluff in this book. Everything that happened led directly into the next thing and, and not even in like a very concise writing kind of way but in a this felt very rushed sort of way. It was just, here's the plot, here's the thing we're gonna do, let's do the thing and now we're done. Like it was very just boom, boom, boom. And while that was frustrating to me at times, I will say it did make it feel kind of like an old folktale or like an odyssey kind of story where it was very much a series of trials just leading between them. And so if that is kind of what she was going for with that, I think that was achieved. However, I don't personally prefer it to a longer, more narrative driven story. That being said, the writing in this was very beautiful. While the pacing was a little strange, I felt like her writing style was very lyrical without being too complicated and I liked that a lot. Like there were moments in this where I felt like the writing was genuinely so pretty but it also didn't drag on because of that and it didn't feel so abstract and complex. And there was a romance element in this and I'm always torn with romance elements because I always end up enjoying them but then on an objective level I feel like it might have been better without it and that's kind of how I felt about this one. Like one of these tabs just says aw because I thought it was cute, but also like I feel like the story didn't necessarily need that and almost might have been more impactful without it. And as a fantasy standalone, it's very solid. I don't read a lot of fantasy standalones, and this is one that I very much enjoyed and would recommend. Next, I read Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, and this I rated four stars, four and a half stars. I really loved this. This is a kind of sci-fi kind of horror novella that follows this group of explorers kind of, but primarily the biologist, as they go on into an expedition into this area known as Area X. So Area X is just kind of this very mysterious natural area of the world that, that the Southern Reach Project has been sending expeditions in over the years. Unfortunately, none of the expeditions ever really come back, and if they do, they come back kind of wrong. So this follows the 12th expedition in. I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this one, partially because again I don't really like horror and this did have some like kind of bio horror creepy elements to it, but I really enjoyed this. This was a very strange book and if you're a kind of person who needs concrete answers, I wouldn't read this because it doesn't give those to you. But what it does do is give you a very strong sense of atmosphere and a very interesting mystery. And I really want to know more of what's going on in this Area X. And watching the way that the environment manipulates these people and watching their experiences within was fascinating. I also really liked the characters in this, primarily the biologist, the main one that we follow throughout the entire story, I thought was very very interesting. A lot of this included passages about her life before the expedition, which at first kind of threw me off, but then I started really enjoying them because I felt like it informed a lot of her decisions that she was making there and it really fleshed out who she was as a person. And while it wasn't as directly related to the plot, I felt like it really showed a lot of the thematic elements of this story. And while I feel like those added something to the story, my favorite parts were absolutely the exploration of Area X. And to compare this to a different book that I read this month, this felt like the Navidson files portions of House of Leaves, which was one of the more interesting parts of that book. So this really felt like it gave me that unsettling, doomed exploration kind of vibes to it. And I really enjoyed this. And the sci-fi elements were really cool. I'm not sure as far as a series where this is gonna go after this. I know there are two more books in the Southern Reach trilogy, but I'm not exactly sure what those are going to entail. But I really loved the writing in this and it makes me want to pick up more of Jeff Vandermeer's books in the future whether that's the next one in this series or something else entirely. I really enjoyed this and it completely came out of left field for me. I was surprised that I liked this one as much as I did. Next, I finished The Three Body Problem by Shin Shin Liu. And this is a hard sci-fi book and I gave this one four stars as well. So this is a sci-fi book that is translated from Chinese that follows this sort of first contact story set in the backdrop of China's cultural revolution. So I found the beginning of this book slightly confusing. It was hard for me to get into it, but once I got in a little bit, I really enjoyed this and I could not put this one down. Our main character is a physicist who kind of gets roped into this investigation and what the military continuously calls a war and the disappearances of these scientists, many of which are committing suicide. And while he's investigating this, he finds this connection to this VR game called Three Body. And when he's in this game, he is part of like the advancement of civilization and in this like simulated civilization there are stable eras where society progresses as normal and then chaotic eras where the weather is really unpredictable, the movement of the sun is very strange, and it's kind of like this giant physics problem that a bunch of these people are working together to solve. The 
free body problem. And in doing so, this simulation turns out to be a lot more than it seems like on the surface, and it ties back into a lot of the disappearing scientists and a lot of what happens at the very beginning. And it's really hard to explain what this book is about because there are multiple threads going on, and even some of the descriptions I've seen talk about stuff that doesn't happen until way later in the book, so I'm trying to avoid that a little bit. But overall, this book really explores different perspectives on humanity and our role in a greater cosmic sense, as well as the advancement of science and culture. And I really thought this was a fascinating book, and I really want to read more of it. Um, I will say one of the main critiques I've seen about this book is that the characters seem really cold, and I've heard that that is like a cultural or a translation difference for a lot of Western readers. And I've got to say, I kind of agree. Like, they weren't very warm, fuzzy characters. There weren't a lot of like highly emotional connection kind of moments, but that doesn't mean the characters were poorly written at all. I still really felt like I was able to connect them and understand their motivations and root for certain characters throughout the entire story. This is another book like Annihilation that's in a series where I'm not as sure where we're going. I'm a little bit more sure about this one because it leaves a very clear path, but the main themes and the three body problem and everything that were tackled in this one, I feel like a lot of that got wrapped up. So while I do see where we're going next, I am interested to see if I'm going to like the following books as much as I did this one. Next thing I read was The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. So this is John Green's newest release and his first work of nonfiction. So this is a collection of essays that take the format of Yelp style reviews of just various things. So this book originally was a podcast that I listened to pretty regularly. I absolutely adored it. And then a lot of those essays from the podcast were collected and edited. So a lot of them are very different in this than they were originally. And some new ones that were added just for this book that explore themes about humanity and hope and growing up, as well as a heavy connection to John Green's life. And I gave this five stars. I knew I was going to love it because I loved the podcast so much. And then the new essays and the changes that were made I absolutely loved. This was a great book to read throughout the month, so reading like a couple of essays a day, because they're not very long and there are a lot of them in here, but some of them pack such an emotional punch. I read somewhere that John Green and his editors structured this book so that the first half is kind of the story of somebody growing up, and the second half is a story about humanity where it's hope and then dips down into despair and then ends on a very hopeful note, and I felt like I could really feel that throughout. And not to mention, this book is funny. Like, I don't think that's talked about enough when I've seen discussions of this book, because it is beautiful and there's moments that maybe tear up, and essays that if I hadn't already listened to them like six times probably would have made me full-on cry, but this book is really funny. I really enjoy the sense of humor here, and this this is a very personal look into John Green's life. This is the most raw any of his works are and relatable to me, and I just absolutely adored it. I know that the audiobook for this is also narrated by John Green, so if you're interested, I would definitely recommend listening to that. You could also listen to the podcast to see if these kinds of essays are something that you even like or think you might enjoy, but I am so happy that I own this. My personal favorite essay in this is his essay on Auld Lang Syne. That one is in the podcast if you want to listen to it to give you kind of an idea. But I just really like this, and this makes me want to read more essay collections because I think I might really like essays. And the final thing I read in the month of June was a graphic novel, and that is Rat Queens Volume 1, and so this was my other five star for the month. So this is a fantasy graphic novel comic book series that follows this party of female adventurers who are your stereotypical rough and tumble adventure party in that they're causing way too much trouble getting into way too many bar fights and are constantly drunk. And they find themselves in the town jail after a particularly rough bar fight and are told that them and and a bunch of other people who were involved can be released if they all go on basically these pro bono quests for the city. And while they're on that quest, someone tries to assassinate them as well as every other adventuring party that was sent out. And so this is a wild ride. This is a very funny, very graphic, just good time of a graphic novel. I had so much fun with this. I knew I was enjoying it pretty much from the jump, but there's one line in here that says, Orcs only know one language, blood, and I'm the fucking alphabet, and that was when I knew this was getting five stars. <laughs> this was just so fun, and I immediately ordered the next three volumes. I'm so happy I decided to just tack this on on the last night of the month because this was so fun. I don't really have anything crit that critical to say about this. If that line about the orcs didn't get you, then this probably isn't for you, but it was great. So this is the stack of books that I finished in June. I finally managed to read a good chunk of stuff again. I'm so excited. But this is also an awkward stack 
so I'm gonna put it down. But all right, that is all of the books I read in June. If you read any of these, please comment down below. I would love to talk about them with you. I clearly have a lot of thoughts on some of these. And if you'd like me to start doing videos where I like dedicate one review to a book, let me know because there were a couple this month that I feel like I could have talked about for a long time. But I think that's all I've got for you guys today. If you want to keep up with what I'm reading, I have a link to my Goodreads down in the description below. But other than that, I'll see you guys next time.